In the last but one video, we looked at the allotropes of carbon, different forms of the element that are made by carbon bonding to itself in different ways. Allotropes are interesting, but they're limited by the fact that you only have one type of atom to work with. Carbon really comes into its own when you start letting it bond with other elements. It forms, in fact, the basis of organic chemistry, which describes a vast range of molecules, all based on carbon, and the most complex of which are the molecules that we, as living creatures, are built from. We'll deal with, uh, deal with organic chemistry in much more detail in Year 12, but for now we're just going to look at a couple of groups of compounds in the simplest family of carbon compounds, called the hydrocarbons. So to summarise hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons are compounds that are principally composed of carbon and hydrogen. Certainly the ones that we're going to look at for now are just composed of carbon and hydrogen. They've got simple structures based on the fact that carbon forms four covalent bonds. Uh, and they form a variety of families according to differences in their structures. They also include most modern fuels like oil, petrol and natural gas. These are all hydrocarbons. The two simplest hydrocarbon families are the alkanes and the alkenes. And these have different chemical properties because of a difference in their bonding. And that's what we're going to look at now. Alkanes are the simplest molecules you can make from just carbon and hydrogen. And you already know the simplest alkane. It's methane. So I'm going to draw the Lewis structure for methane. Lewis structures for hydrocarbons are very easy. As long as you're just dealing with carbon and hydrogen, there are no lone pairs, and you just need to follow the rule that carbon will always form four bonds, and hydrogen will always form one. The next in the series of alkanes is called ethane, and you make it by taking two carbon atoms, joining them with a single bond, and then filling up their remaining three bonds each with hydrogen. So its overall formula is C2H6. Next is propane. Now we have three carbons, again joined by single bonds, and again we fill up all the unused bonds that the carbon atoms could make with hydrogen. That's three for the end carbon, two for the middle, and three for the other end carbon. So the formula for propane is C3H8. And next is butane, four carbons. Fill them up with hydrogens, and that gives you C4H10. Now the alkane series continues. Each time you add one carbon to the molecule uh, and you fill up the remaining bonds with hydrogen, the molecule gets longer and longer. After the first four, the names are easier to remember because they're the same as the geometrical shapes. A pentagon has five sides, for instance, and pentane has five carbons. And then you've got hexane with six, and heptane with seven, and octane, nonane, decane, and so on. I'll stop there, but there isn't really any limit to how long you can make the molecule. In fact, the really long ones are polymers, which I'll mention in a little while. The other family we're going to look at is alkenes. These are also made just from carbon and hydrogen, and they also follow a series where each molecule is one carbon longer than the last. But the crucial difference between alkanes and alkenes is that alkenes have at least one carbon-carbon double bond in the molecule. We're only going to look at the alkanes that have exactly one double bond at the end of the molecule here, but there are variations on this theme that we'll explore next year. So I'm going to skip the first one. You'll see why in a second. Let's go straight to ethene. The eth part of the name tells you that there are two carbons. That's just like ethane in the alkanes. So we put down the two carbons, and then, because it's an alkene, we join them up with a double bond. That's the defining feature of the alkene. Now we simply fill in the remaining bonds with hydrogens. Each carbon forms four bonds, and two have already been taken up by the double bond, so each carbon gets two hydrogens, and the formula for ethene is C2H4. Now, let's go back to methene. Can you see that it isn't possible to have a methene molecule? The defining feature, remember, was a double bond between two carbon atoms, but methene would have only one carbon, so it just doesn't exist. Okay, so the next one in the series after ethene is propene with three carbons. So we draw them out, and we join the first two by a double bond, and the next by a single. Remember, we said that we were going to focus on alkenes with just one double bond here. And then we fill in the remaining bonds with hydrogens. That gives us C3H6. Next, we've got butane, four carbons. We join the first two by a double bond, and then fill in the hydrogens. And that gives us C4H8. 
and the series continues with pentene and hexene and so on. For practice, it's a good idea to try drawing out these larger alkanes and alkenes. So now we're going to look at a little bit of terminology. You may have heard of saturated and unsaturated fats. You would probably come across it in the context of fats. Fats are in fact also hydrocarbons of a particular kind. But there is a particular chemical meaning to this saturated uh, and unsaturated. The reasoning behind these terms is this. When a hydrocarbon has all single bonds, as in an alkane, that means it's bonding to the maximum number of hydrogen atoms that it's possible for that molecule to carry. Let me draw out butane, C4H10. Now, there's no way to attach more hydrogen atoms to this molecule. All possible bonds have been used. So we say the molecule is saturated with hydrogen. However, if I now draw butene with a double bond between two of the carbon atoms, in order to form this double bond, we need to lose a hydrogen from each of the carbons in order to free up the two electrons to form the new double bond. So the molecular formula for this compound is C4H8. That's two hydrogens less than butane. It's therefore called unsaturated because if you broke that second bond in the double bond, it would be possible to attach more hydrogens to this molecule. So it's not saturated with hydrogen. Now let's have a look at how alkanes and alkenes compare in terms of properties. For their physical properties, they're pretty similar. Both are insoluble in water, both are less dense than water, and both are colourless. However, their chemical properties are quite distinct. They have in common that they're both good fuels. They combust in air to give carbon dioxide and water. However, there the similarities end. Alkanes are generally unreactive, which has to do with the fact that the carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds are quite stable. Alkenes, on the other hand, have this carbon-carbon double bond, and the second bond in the double bond is not as strong as the first, which means that alkanes, sorry, alkenes are able to undergo a number of reactions that involve breaking that second bond and adding something new onto the molecule. And for this reason, these reactions are called addition reactions. Alkenes are also polymerizable. That means they can be turned into polymers. Again, it's because of that less stable second bond. They can be joined together in long strings to give polymers. And we'll look at these in a second. So let's have a quick look at some of the ways that it's possible to add things to an alkene molecule. I'm going to show you the four most common kinds of addition reaction. In the first one here, one of the two bonds in the carbon-carbon double bond breaks and the two freed up bonds, one on each carbon, join onto halogen atoms from a diatomic halogen molecule. I've shown bromine here, but it can happen with any of the halogens, fluorine, chlorine or iodine. This reaction is called halogenation because you're adding halogen atoms to the alkene. And this reaction happens fairly easily and at room temperature. The second reaction is hydrogenation. The process is the same, but this time two hydrogen atoms are added to the two new bonds, which turns the alkene into an alkane. This reaction has a much higher activation energy, and a catalyst is often used to make the reaction go faster. The platinum, shown here, is an example of a catalyst that can be used. Another possibility is hydrohalogenation, sort of a cross between halogenation and hydrogenation. In this reaction, a hydrogen halide, or in effect an acid, one of these will add across the double bond so that one carbon gets an extra hydrogen and the other carbon gets a halogen atom of some kind. And finally, there's hydration. The name suggests water. You drink water to keep hydrated, right? Well, in the hydration reaction, a water molecule is split into two parts and it adds across the double bond. One carbon atom gets an extra hydrogen atom and the other carbon atom gets the rest of the water molecule, an OH, an oxygen and a hydrogen. And in organic chemistry, when a molecule has an OH group, we call it an alcohol. So this reaction is one way of turning an alkene into an alcohol. This difference in the chemical properties of alkanes and alkenes, this, this specific ability of alkanes to add things across the double bond, gives us a really convenient way of distinguishing them, despite the fact that visually they look identical. As we've just said, alkenes will react with halogens easily at room temperature. 
Alkanes, on the other hand, are quite unreactive, and to make them react with halogens, you would need to expose them to UV light or high temperatures. This difference gives us the bromine water test. Bromine water is an aqueous solution of bromine which has the characteristic brown colour of bromine. When bromine water is added to an alkene, the less dense alkene floats on top of the bromine water and it doesn't mix with it. But if you shake the test tube to temporarily mix the two liquids, the brown colour completely disappears from the bromine water. This is because the bromine that was dissolved in the water has reacted with the alkene molecules in one of these addition reactions. In contrast, if you add bromine water to an alkane at room temperature, no colour change occurs at all because there's insufficient activation energy to cause a reaction and the water remains brown. So the essence of the test is, if you have an unknown organic liquid and you want to know if it's an alkane or an alkene, you add bromine water and you shake it. If the bromine water loses its colour, it's an alkene, and if it stays brown, it's an alkane. The final type of reaction of alkenes we're going to look at is polymerization, just very briefly. From an industrial point of view, this is a massively important reaction because we use so many plastics these days. The basic idea is this. A polymer is a very, very long molecule that's made by joining smaller molecules together in a chain, much like a chain of paper clips. The smaller molecules are known as monomers. Mono means one and mer means part, one part. So when monomers are joined together, they make a polymer, many parts. Your body contains many biopolymers, polymers made by biological processes like DNA and RNA and proteins. But the simplest example of polymerization is the formation of polyethene, also known as polyethylene, from the alkene called ethene. Here it's just drawn as symbols. Each E represents an ethene molecule and they string together to make a great long chain. However, if we draw things out in more detail, here are the ethene monomers. The polymerization reaction occurs when a double bond, when the second bond in the double bond breaks in an ethene monomer, and that allows each of the end carbons to form a new bond with an adjacent molecule. And this continues on in a kind of chain reaction linking more and more molecules together. Note that the resulting long molecule has all single bonds. It is in fact a giant alkane. To save writing the whole thing out, a polymer is often written like this, with the repeating unit placed in brackets, and a subscript telling you how many of these repeating units there are. Okay, so that's all we've got on alkanes and alkenes. I'll see you in class.